There are different kinds of systems that we will deal with in statics. The first and most basic of them is a truss. A truss is any object, a system built up of more than one thing, where all of the things you're building out of are two-force members. So you do need to know what a two-force member is. There are three things that are required. They have to be pinned at both ends, you have to have forces only at the pins, and you have no moments anywhere. The greatest thing about that is if you look at the free body diagram of an individual two-force member, no matter what your loads are, you know that there aren't any moments. So if you had two forces at each end, we can look at this equations of equilibrium for this to show that whatever forces in the y you have, this force and that force would be the same. But if you look at the sum of the moments, those two red arrows would cause a couple, which would cause this to spin. So, in fact, these two forces must be zero. Thus, concluding that any two-force member only has forces that lie along its length. And that becomes very important when we're dealing with this. It, of truss, a two-force member only carries an axial load along, its line of ac along the line of action of a member. And system, trusses are systems that don't have anything else but these members. Now, when I ask you to analyze a truss, what I'm asking you is to find this axial load that's carried in every single one of the two force members in your truss. So how do you do that? A couple of things of vocabulary before we even get going. The joints are the, the, the corners, and the members are the pieces that go in between them. So what I'm looking for is to find out what the forces are in every single one of these members in my truss. Now your basic shape is going to be a triangle. My triangle came apart. Here's my basic shape. All of our trusses are made out of triangles. And it's important that you keep in mind that at the corners of all of these are pins, kind of like my magnets. If you have a basic shape that's a square and somebody comes along and pushes on it, your square collapses. It's not rigid. The triangle is a rigid shape, and I can actually push on the corner here, and it, the whole thing might rotate, but the truss itself will not deform its shape. So we're going to have a whole bunch of triangles. Please note that no single member can be contiguous from one side to the other. So even if you have a straight line here, we're not going to consider this member to be the same as that member. You have to have a joint in between them. External forces can be applied only at the joints. If you had a force that was acting in the middle of one of your members, pulling down right here, that would create a non-axial load in your member. And we've just shown that you can't have anything but axial loads. So all of our forces have to act at the joints. There aren't going to be any moments. Same thing. If you need to deal with the weight, that means that you have to put the weight half at each joint on either end of the member. Most of the time, we don't even bother. A truss structure is so much stronger than any individual weight of its members that it's generally these weights become part of the noise and we ignore them. Please note that by the principle of transmissibility, you can slide a force along its line of action on the object it acts on. So if you have this force acting here on this joint, you can't slide it to be acting on a different member. So even if you have joints lined up, the force has to be applied at the joint that it acts at, not at some other joint that lies along its line. So what does it look like if you dismember a truss? Here is a basic truss with a pin at one end and a roller at the other and a couple of external loads applied here. When I take these apart, I can consider the free body diagram of each individual member. It's a two-force member, so whatever is acting along that that whatever force there is has to be acting along the member itself. So if this is theta, then that's the angle for these forces. Same thing here. So I would have these, for this member ED, I would have two forces that are acting along the member itself. Equal and opposite says that whatever is hap happening at this point, at the end of member E, has to be happening at the joint at member E. If you pull on the door, it pulls on you. So there has to be equal and opposite forces right here, FCE and FCE. And the same thing with FED and FED, and the other two members over here. So when you're looking at the free body diagram of your joints, 
it will have the forces that come from the members lying along the line of action of those members. We're going to assume that all of the members, all of the members in your truss are in tension. Somebody's pulling on them, which means that all of these free body diagrams for the members have the arrows for their loads coming out. Equal and opposite means that all of the members acting at the truss, forces from the members, are acting out from the joint itself because these are equal and opposite. So all of the arrows that act in, on my joint lie along the member and point out from the joint. So this would be my free body diagram for the joint at E. Once I have that and I understand this little rigmarole, you don't have to draw the free body, di free body diagrams of the members anymore. You can just consider the free body diagram of the joint. And the nice thing about this joint is that it's a particle. All of your forces will act at a concurrent point. So at this point, all I'm going to end up with is the sum of the forces in X and sum of the forces in Y for each of my individual joints. All of your free body diagrams still need all of your forces and all of your angles and everything to be a complete and accurate free body diagram. So, how many equations do you get? If you have n joints, then you have two n equations. And you will have these equations of equilibrium for each of your joints. Now, sometimes what you want to do is actually start with the free body diagram of the entire structure. That helps you know where you're at and it helps you find your external loads. Your entire structure is actually going to be a rigid body. It has the possibility of rotating. It has dimensions. So you can write the sum of the forces in X, the sum of the forces Y, and the sum of the moments for your entire structure. But please note that these equations are not linearly independent from these. You don't get 2n plus 3. You only get 2n, and you will find that these actually get duplicated up in this 2n equations. You still do it sometimes anyway, because what that allows you to do is start with actual numbers and solve actual numbers as you go through the equations. Another place to start is at a joint that only has two unknowns, because again, you can solve and you can get an actual number, or a place where you're given an external load and you have a number to start with. Often, your joints are only going to have three unknowns, which means, and the yes, this is a cumulative course, you can look at the free body diagram of that particle and draw a force triangle for it. So all of the methods that we developed early in the semester for all of these particle equations, of particle equations of equilibrium, come right back here, and this is an excellent way to study for the final exam. So you can write your equations of the laws of sines and cosines or the equations of equilibrium that look like this.